The history of 3D Mario games is the story about how the greatest and brightest icons in the video game industry define the 3D platformer and continued to evolve it for the next two decades. Across this four-part opening of our new series, we will go through it all from Super Mario 64, Sunshine, Galaxy 1 and 2, 3D Land, and 3D World to Super Mario Odyssey and tell how Nintendo and Super Mario have managed to surge and succeed against fierce competition from giants such as Microsoft and Sony. Welcome to the first episode of Nintendo History. The first attempts to bring Super Mario into the third dimension can be traced back to the early 1990s, shortly after the launch of Super Mario World for the Super Nintendo. Back then, series creator and producer Shigeru Miyamoto-san, who had recently began work on Star Fox with the London-based developer Argonaut, envisioned to utilize the powerful Super FX chip to develop a 3D-based Super Mario title for the Super Nintendo Entertainment System. In an exclusive interview with Nintendo Power one year prior to the launch, Miyamoto stated that, quote, I first had the idea to do a 3D Mario game when I was working on Star Fox. That was five years ago. I'd always wanted to do a game that recreated an entire world in miniature, like miniature trains. When I saw what could be done with 3D modeling on the Star Fox game, I knew we could do much more. Nintendo and Miyamoto knew that the transition to 3D, which they themselves had initiated for consoles with Star Fox, was imminent. And as Miyamoto-san stated during Shou Shinkai in 1995, the work with concepts for this revolutionary 3D Mario game began already in late 1992. Even so, it didn't take long until the entire project was moved to Nintendo's next system, the Silicon Graphics-powered Ultra 64. Surprisingly, Miyamoto-san's decision to transfer the game from the SNES to the Ultra 64 was not fully influenced by the superior power of the upcoming system, but due to the fact that the system's controller had more buttons, and more importantly, after a personal demand from Miyamoto, C-Stick. With it, the premise for what would become Super Mario 64 was set, and after months of playing around with different camera positions and movement animations, the team could abandon the original plan for a fixed isometric game. Sixteen people at Nintendo EAD, including Yoshiaki Koizumi-san and Takashi Tezuka-san, worked relentlessly for two years to simply make things work, as nothing like this had ever been done before. One of the greatest challenges in the transition from the second to the third dimension was to accurately program jumping distance. Miyamoto-san stated in a later interview that, quote, In earlier Mario games, we were able to measure the number of pixels Mario could jump and know exactly what was possible. But this time, we had to design the level so that as long as your jump was close enough, you'd make it. It was too hard for the player to judge. This was a design change we made in the middle of development when the game was far already very complete. Everything was open from a movement perspective and the only linear levels in the game with the fixed part would be the Bowser levels, due to the need of having a direct path to the boss. No longer would the plumber's health be determined by power-ups such as mushrooms. Instead, a health wheel which could be replenished by collecting coins was implemented. Outside of the painting-based levels, the introduction of a hub world allowed for a setting where the player could return and progress deeper into Peach's castle. The openness of both the castle and levels resulted that the need for a traditional endpoint flagpole was obsolete and finally scratched in favor of multiple stars hidden in each level. This system allowed for unseen to this point exploration in a 3D environment. The game with music from legendary composer Koji Kondo was nearly ready to be shown to the world, but not before Charles Martinet 
who had been the official voice of Mario since 1990, was included in a real and proper mainline Mario game. It's me, Mario! And not Mario teaching typing or Mario's fundamentals. I'm going to fly for you. Uh, uh. Even though that 3D head from that game most likely inspired the title screen for Super Mario 64. After years of planning, experimentation, and development, on November 24, 1995, Nintendo changed the video game world with a playable demo of Super Mario 64, a title which at that point was planned to feature 32 courses. There is no doubt that Shigeru Miyamoto was incredibly ambitious with Mario 64, as he aimed for as many as 40 courses. Even so, in the end, the pressured Mario team at EAD was forced to settle for 15 courses with a number of stars in each of them to fit the game on an N64 cartridge and meet the extended delay accepted by Nintendo's president, Hiroshi Yamauchi. Since the launch of Super Mario 64 was tied to the launch of the Nintendo 64, it was thus gradual with June 23, 1996 as the release date of the system and game in Japan, September 29th for North America, and March 1st, 1997 in Europe. The game was praised for its innovative and daring 3D gameplay, and credited as the first game franchise to make a successful transition from the second to third dimension. Needless to say, the game was key to Nintendo 64's solid launch and hunt after the Sony PlayStation which unfortunately was a train that would never be caught, mostly due to the third-party exodus following Nintendo's decision to stick with cartridges. This decision turned Super Mario 64's load times dramatically down, but in return cost a ton of future titles and partnerships for Nintendo. Even though the game at first wasn't sold bundled with the system, Super Mario 64 went on to sell near 12 million copies across the N64's life cycle. With these numbers, it was obvious that a sequel with some of the previously teased courses and unused ideas was next for Miyamoto-san and his team. A few months after the launch, in January 1997, Shigeru Miyamoto-san spoke openly to Nintendo Power about Super Mario 128 being the title for the sequel, and referenced in an interview later that year with 64 Dream that, quote, we're in the middle of preparing Mario 64 2 for release on the 64 DD. I'd like to take advantage of the 64 DD's ability to store information. As of now, Luigi's also a full part of the game, but we haven't started thinking about two player gameplay with Mario and Luigi yet. Needless to say, despite numerous references and teases over the next few years, Super Mario 128 never materialized beyond demos due to the 64DD's massive failure in Japan. It also didn't help that Miyamoto-san had his hands full on other projects such as The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time and then afterwards the new IP Pikmin. Finally, in late 2000, the Mario team at Nintendo EAD moved on from the cartridge-based N64 to the mini-DVD-driven codename Dolphin the later GameCube. The work on a proper successor to Super Mario 64 had begun. As a premise for the new game, Yoshiaki Koizumi-san played around the idea of giving Mario a water pump and moved the game setting from Peach's Castle to a much larger tropical setting, Isle Delfino. The experimentation with this water pump would eventually result in Super Mario Sunshine. Flood apart from communicating with Mario, represented a radical break as Mario could now jetpack his way high up to buildings and even thin rope lines. The verticality was expanded heavily as the search for the shine sprites required Mario to perform complicated acrobatic moves and clean up a giant mess of colorful graffiti, all features that were impossible to pull off in Super Mario 64. It was here that the GameCube's power and controller shine. Words cannot describe how crucial this C-Stick was in implementing the first and only until Super Mario Odyssey fully controlled dual analog camera controls in a mainline Mario game. But the radical improvement of the camera controls and inclusion of a water pump was just the beginning. As for Super Mario Sunshine, Nintendo EAD implemented for the first time overworld bosses and mini-bosses and a high number of NPCs within the hub world town Delfino Plaza. 
In fact, in a Nintendo-hosted developer interview conducted by then-company president Satoru Iwata-san with Shigeru Miyamoto-san, Takashi Tezuka-san, and Yoshiaki Koizumi-san, it was revealed that it was first late in development that the team made a greater effort to make the gameplay more similar to Super Mario 64 in what Miyamoto called a conservative move. Takashi Tezuka-san supported this notion by stating, quote, the basic game is similar to the N64 version, Super Mario 64. We have intentionally made it seem familiar and simple to play. Despite only being less than a year in development, the first teaser of Super Mario Sunshine was presented at the last Nintendo Space World in August 2001. This one presented a much more ambitious game with a release date for the next summer, 2002. This was possible thanks to a new engine system implemented at Nintendo which was detailed by Shigeru Miyamoto-san. To tell you the truth, Super Mario Sunshine was developed on Nintendo's new R&D system, which integrates a 3D engine with other engines. This is a new system. When you use it, the time required for game projects is significantly reduced. So, Super Mario Sunshine was the very first game to be developed on this basic system. Still, the one-and-a-half-year-long development cycle quickly turned into a hassle for the development team. The constant time constraints and immense pressure led to unavoidable cutting of planned in-game content. This included a connecting train system and five worlds that didn't make it into the final game. One of these was Corona Mountain, which lacked the multiple Shine Sprites episodes found in the other worlds in the game. Even so, this doesn't mean that Sunshine was thin in content. Far from it, as it brought back writable Yoshis, included a much more concentrated plot with cinematic cutscenes and actual twists compared to the previous games. Within the game, there were three types of levels, large open areas with flood, smaller secret platforming challenges, and the floodless Mario action stages. The last two would turn out to be far more influential in Mario's later Wii adventures. Sunshine, unlike Super Mario 64, would include more substantial voice acting for a number of characters within cutscenes. These included Papa Toad, Bowser Jr., notoriously Bowser, Mario! How dare you disturb my family vacation! And most importantly, Mario's new water pump gun companion, Flood. Another detail that is often overlooked with Sunshine is that the final E3 2002 demo still played at 60 frames per second, but by the Japanese release one month later, the game was locked at 30 frames per second. To this allegation, Shigeru Miyamoto-san replied that, Some people may realize that Super Mario Sunshine does not work on 60 frames per second, which you are seeing on screen is 30 frames. However, the game is made so that you will feel it is more than a 30 frame game. Everything was set for the major release of Nintendo's greatest system seller, Super Mario Sunshine, across the summer and fall of 2002. But the reception and aftermath of Super Mario Sunshine and the Super Mario Galaxy Wii era will be addressed in the next part of Nintendo History, History of 3D Mario. Nintendo History is financed by our generous Patreon donors, including our Patreon Royal Producers, Transcendent Sacred Courage, and Kenyatta Ali. Help us make more costly, high-quality productions by checking out patreon.com slash common realm. Thank you so much for watching this first part of our new series. Do not miss the second part, which comes next week. Make sure to subscribe to the Commonwealth Realm. Comment and like this video to appreciate the work and value put into this massive series.